I want to go over some announcements really quick this morning. Uh, next week, next Sunday is Promotion Sunday. So if you have a student or a, a child who is promoting, next week will be the day that they start in their, in their new room. So just want to make everybody aware of that. Um, also, our school supply drive for Kirkwood Middle School ends next Sunday. So you got one more week to pick up some last-minute school supplies, uh, and then our baskets in the back are filling up, which I love seeing that. Uh, we'll just keep piling that up and, uh, and drop that off with the new middle school next week as school gets started. Um, after service, we will have our August uh, Kids Ministry Rotation sign-up sheet. So uh, if you wouldn't mind volunteering for one or two slots in the month of August, we would appreciate that in our kids' ministry area. I uh, want to make sure that everybody is getting the, uh, the weekly church email. Uh, that's going to be a weekly point uh, to get information about what's going on uh, and then any other important updates that may be happening. And I want to keep the 14th and the 28th in front of everybody. Those are our community events that we're going to be having here. Um, we've got the plans kind of in motion for those. Um, the mailers have gone out to 2,900 homes in in our area. Um, so we can expect like a million people to be here. I don't know. I don't know how many people are going to be here, but we're going we're gonna to bless those and, and love those who do come and, and hopefully enjoy them uh, and, and maybe even add a few to our church family here. Um, we do have our Connect cards in the back, so if you're new or newer and you've not filled one of those out, I would love for you to fill that out. That way we can get your information, get you plugged in, figure out ways that we can minister to you at this time. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. That's where we're going to be hanging out this morning as we begin this new series. Uh, Leslie Minnie, you guys don't know Leslie. But uh, she appeared to be a very healthy, very, very active, uh, middle-aged, outdoor enthusiast. She loved to hike. She loved to trail run. She loved to mountain bike. These were all things that she really enjoyed uh, doing. But little did she know that only hours after attending a race for survivors of heart-related disease she would be counted among them. She had no idea. She went on a hike after this morning race. While on that hike, Leslie became short of breath, but she, she dismissed her short of breathness as just issues from the altitude. This is out west, and you know, when you go out west, you get up in the mountains, altitude, you go, you go yeah, Chris is giving me an amen. I was just there, I know. She dismissed it. Later on the hike, her chest became tight, but she just kind of sloughed it off as maybe her, her backpack was on too tight and she needed to loosen it. It wasn't until she passed out while she was on this hike and rushed to the yard that she realized the danger that she was actually in. While she was in the ER, the doctors discovered that she had a 99% coronary artery blockage, 99%. 99% blockage. The blood that, was, that her heart was trying to pump to her extremities, her the heart, which is the, the life source for our bodies, her, her heart that was doing all this work, trying to pump blood out so that she could stay alive, so that she could have function with all of her arms and her head and use her brain, that there was so much blockage there that she passed out. Doctors had to operate on her immediately. She had a clogged artery. Clogged arteries in our, our bodies are extremely, extremely dangerous. They can have life and death consequences if we don't, if we don't take care of the issue. And friends, likewise, I believe that there are attacks from our spiritual enemy that are intended to clog our spiritual arteries and ultimately lead to death. As we head into a, a new school year, settle into maybe new rhythms and routines or old rhythms and routines from last school year as we kind of resume the hustle and bustle of life after 
the pleasure of summer break, I want us to be mindful of our spiritual health, and so we're going to spend a few weeks in a new series that we're calling Clogged Arteries. And this series is intended to identify the side effects of spiritually clogged arteries which put our hearts, right? The Bible says, guard your heart above all else for it is the wellspring of life. Our, our heart is, is where our spiritual lives stem from, where it happens, where our relationship with Jesus pumps fuel and blood and life into our bodies that we can go into the world, seek first the kingdom of God, live out the realities of the gospel. But if we're not careful, our Our arteries can get clogged, and it can have catastrophic consequences. So what we want to do then is we want to invite Jesus, the great physician, into our hearts to heal when and where necessary. This series, I want it to do do two things. I want it to be preventative, and as we go into this new school year and all of the realities that a new school year brings for so many of us. I want it to be preventative in, in identifying places where our, artery, our arteries might already be clogged or could potentially get clogged up and to say, okay, what do I need to do? What rhythms and routines do I need to add into my life or maybe get out of my life? That way I can have a healthy spiritual life that my heart can pump the way it's supposed to. I want it to be preventative And it may also be prescriptive, because I think there's some of us in here today who our hearts are blocked. We've got things happening in our lives, and if we don't invite Jesus in, if we don't identify those areas, again, it can have very serious, very serious consequences. the thing, about, the thing about clogged arteries is that they don't just clog up overnight. It's, it's, it builds up over time. Things build up. Bitterness builds up. Anxiety builds up. Anger builds up. It, do, it doesn't just happen like one time and then all of a sudden there's this explosive, catastrophic moment. That's not generally how it happens. It's, it's, it, 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 things happen over time. They build up. They build up. They build up. Just like in our physical bodies, clogged arteries, coronary, coronary heart attacks, they don't happen just one time. It's, it's the result of, of debris that gets built up over and over, day after day after day from different things and causes that ultimately leads to this issue. And again, I think likewise, if we don't recognize where the enemy is attacking us, we don't recognize the unhealthy things that are a part of our lives, then it can lead to really dangerous places. Clogged arteries are responsible. The two deadliest issues that they cause is heart attacks, and strokes. It causes heart attacks because since there's so much buildup in those arteries, the blood can't get through. Blood just stops right there, and it ultimately causes your heart to stop. And again, I think if we're not careful, there can be things that happen in our lives that cause us to just stop. The other one is a stroke. Because there's so much blockage in the arteries, the blood can't properly flow to the brain, and then the brain tell us what to do, right? And similarly, I think if what Jesus is trying to do in and to our hearts, if that can't get to our minds to show us how we are supposed to live our lives, then we become ineffective. And so my hope in this series is that we identify some of these things and take the steps necessary to address them. This week we're talking about anxiety. I think there's like an anxiety epidemic going on. I remember from my time in student ministry, every single student that came through my student ministry apparently had an anxiety disorder. I don't know what it was, but they just like, you know, I'd ask, hey, do you want to do, I can't, I've got anxiety. What? That doesn't make any sense. But apparently that is very real. And and sometimes I think students may say that as a cop-out, but I think there are certainly times in our lives where we become overwhelmed with being anxious. Like it just stops us in our tracks. 
we, we become crippled by these feelings of anxiety. And so again, as we start a new school year, I think for maybe the teachers among us or students among us, uh, if we don't identify those places where anxiety creeps in, that can build up and lead to all kinds of issues. And maybe, maybe it's not a new school year, right? Maybe, maybe you're not going to a new school or starting a new school year. Maybe it's just something that's going on at your job. You're starting a new job or going back to a job or, or there's something that has happened at your workplace and you just, you're just constantly consumed by thinking about this relationship or this issue, whatever it may be. Maybe it's, maybe it's figuring out new schedules, right? Coordinating new schedules. I know Lincoln's going back to FLP and so that's going to kind of throw a wrench in where, like how do we get him there and me to my workplace and Sarah to be able to do the things that she needs to do. That kind of stuff can lead to anxious feelings. Maybe it's just the season of life that you're in. Maybe it's an opportunity that's before you and you're thinking about this opportunity. How do I seize the opportunity? How do I thrive? How do I succeed in this opportunity? And you're just thinking about all these different things and you have this feeling of all of a sudden you're starting to get anxious and you get anxious. Maybe it's a problem or difficulty that you have in life. All of these can lead to anxious feelings. And let me say this, um, I think in a lot of ways that's normal but I think in every way that's not from God. It's normal, okay? So I I don't want you to feel condemned. I don't want you to feel like you're bad or any worse because you feel these feelings of anxiousness and anxiety, but I do want to say I don't think it's from God. I know it's not from God. We'll look at it in just a second. So first, what is anxiety? Anxiety is a feeling of fear, Anxiety can come from this feeling of dread, right? Like you've you've got a conversation that you have to have and you're just absolutely dreading having that conversation. It's It's a feeling of uneasiness, right? You're in the midst of a situation and you just feel really, really uneasy about the outcome or the potential outcome in this situation. I heard a pastor say one time, and I really, really like this. A pastor said, anxiety comes from either reliving or pre living a situation. Right, you're reliving something that's happened in your life. And, and it, you just feel it, like, start to boil from your gut. And, and it, it has this visceral, physical feeling that's associated with it, but it comes from reliving something that has already happened to you, or it comes from pre-living a situation. Right, you know you have to have a conversation. You know you have to have an interaction with a person. You know that there's something that you have to do, and you are pre-living all the possibilities that could come from that situation. What if this happens? What if they say this? What, what if they counter with that? What if she does this? We're pre-living these things. And again, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, these feelings of anxiety and anxiousness and fear and dread and uneasiness, they start to boil within us. And before we know it, we could become crippled. That happened to my friend Matt Mellon one time. Um, granted, we were at an altitude of about 5,000 feet on um, a rock face on Mount Washington in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. So it's kind of understandable, but he just locked up. I mean, we, we had hiked all this way up Mount Washington, and there's this section of Mount Washington on Huntington's Ravine where it's just rock face. And it's not like totally like mountain climbing, right, like rock climbing, but it's like you're, you're at least like on all fours kind of having to scale up this, this side of the mountain. And it, it, it can be kind of scary. It can be, it can cause some anxiety. Um, and what he didn't tell us was that he was deathly afraid of heights. Like, Matt, that would have been good to know before we went and climbed the, the tallest point in on, in the AT. That, that would have been a really good information for you to share with us, but I remember him just totally frozen, crippled, absolutely locked up, unable to take one more step because he was anxious. He was pre-living situation. What if I put my hand here and the rock falls? What if I put my foot here and it slips? Again, to be fair, if he were to slip, it would not be good. 
but he was locked up. He was pre-living this, cer- this situation. And I, and I think in, in many ways, that's where anxiety comes from. It's, it comes from uncertainty. And we've all been in uncertain situations, right? This past week, I was, got the opportunity to travel. If you saw my email, then, uh, then you got to see a little bit of the story. But there was a moment, just a moment, where I was a little bit anxious because we didn't know where we were staying that night. And again, I'm a planner. I like to, I like to know exactly what's going to happen and when it's going to happen and who's supposed to be there. And, you know, I like to have all the answers planned out. I don't really like uncertainty. And so we're sitting there at like 8.30 at dinner, and that's when we're finding where we're going to be sleeping that night. It was an uncertain situation for me, and it was a little bit anxiety-inducing. Again, if you read my email, you knew that I was totally fine with it because I knew that, you know, there there were so many other circumstances and factors where God was going to take care of us, and at the very least, Freddie T. was going to take care of me. Uh, but, but, But that sense of uncertainty and unknowing, for me, was a little bit uneasy, and I think we have all been in situations where we've felt that. Matt Mellon certainly did. Our anxiety comes from a sense of uncertainty, but hear me with every ounce of love that I have for you, uh, anxiety ultimately comes from a lack of trust in God. And I don't think we want to like say that when we feel anxious. Like I don't think we want to confess when we have those feelings of anxiety. God, I just don't trust you right now. But ultimately, that's what it is. It's this recognition that there's certain aspects of my life that I don't have absolute control of, and because I don't have control of it, I'm not sure God does either. When Matt was on the rock face of Mount Washington, ultimately he didn't trust Larry, who was one of the guys with us who had done it time and time and time again. He didn't trust that Larry was going to you know, take us a path that was going to be successful. Ultimately, Matt didn't trust that Graham and I, who were right there next to him, were right there with him, that we weren't going to let him fall, that we weren't concerned about it. He, he was so focused on all the what-ifs around him that had negative end results that he didn't trust that he wasn't alone. Church family, you see the spiritual connection here, right? Anxiety is this belief that I'm alone. And I've got to figure it out, and I don't know how to figure it out. But the remedy to anxiety is this constant recognition and confession that God is with us. He demonstrated that most in Jesus Christ, right? The incarnation, when God literally, physically came to dwell among us. And then after Jesus left, he said, power will come upon you and you'll receive my Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the reminder, his physical presence with us. We're not alone. Because we're not alone, we don't have to be anxious. What do we do? We remember that he is faithful. Listen to the way that Jesus puts it in. Matthew chapter 6. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to turn to Matthew 6, verse 25. Jesus preaching a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, one of his most famous sermons, one of the longest consecutive recordings of Jesus' teaching, preaching to this lower class Jewish society under the oppression of Rome, not certain about what the new emperor or the new governor is going to do in in their town, says these words to this people, and I believe he says the same to us this morning, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. My grandpa passed away um, about a month ago, maybe a little bit more than that, six weeks or so. We've got a celebration of life next weekend for him. 
And uh, towards the end of his life, he took up bird watching. I don't know why. But in his little retirement community in Pleasant Hill, Tennessee, he would sit on his screened in back porch with a pair of binoculars for hours and hours and hours and hours. And I don't know if he, like, learned anything about birds or was able to, like, tell the difference between a robin and a blue jay or a cardinal. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he could. But, friends, I think in some ways we need to learn to be bird watchers. As we consider the, the anxiousness of our hearts, what if we sat down and just looked at a bird? Because Jesus says, look at them. They don't reap. They don't toil. They don't worry about where they're going to stay or if they're going to have food. Jesus goes on to say, are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And what's this about you being anxious about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more, friend here, much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after these things. Listen to this good news. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, Jesus says, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus is reminding the people, the crowd that's gathered on this side of a mountain to look to the goodness of God in creation. To look to the goodness of God, right? Because if, if God takes care of the most trivial things in creation, birds, flowers, if, God, if, if they don't worry and God has cared and provided and created them to fulfill whatever purpose they may have, and they don't bear the image of God, how much more will he take care of us who is his prized creation? We bear the image of God. God's got stake in us. Every single human being God has stake in. And if that's the case, then we don't have to worry. We don't have to be anxious. God knows what we need. He goes on teaching in Matthew chapter 7, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be opened. I love this. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Anxiety, it's a spiritual enemy that clogs our arteries. Anxiety, it's a spiritual enemy that when left unchecked builds up and builds up and builds up and leads to this absolute distrust that God is good and God will provide. So what do we do? Well, first we, like Jesus tells us, we look to the goodness of God in creation. We remind ourselves of his faithfulness, faithfulness to the smallest, most trivial aspects of creation, how much more to those of us who bear his image. But then listen to what Paul says. I think Paul gets really, really practical for us. If you would, turn to Philippians chapter 4. Um, one of the things that I love to say, because I think it's true, is that God never tells us what to do without first telling us why we should do it. 
I've, I've said that before and I've given a couple of different examples. The Ten Commandments would be one of those examples, right? How does the Ten Commandments start? You shall have no other gods. No, that's not how it starts. That's verse 3. Verse 1 and 2 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. And there, there, there's this implied therefore. So why do we obey the Ten Commandments? Why was Israel to obey the Ten Commandments? Because God delivered them. He's the Lord God and he delivered them. That's why or we look at the Great Commission, right? How does the Great Commission start? All authority has been given to me. That's why we then go. It's the same here in Philippians 4. Right, if we were to just pick up in verse 6, it would say, do not be anxious about anything. But if we back up to the end of verse 5, look what it says. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. And then there's this implied, therefore, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything. Right, so Jesus gives some, some specifics to his to his to the crowd in his context, right? He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to drink. Don't worry about the clothes that you're going to wear, right? He's speaking to some of the specifics of his context. Paul, I love it, he's just like everything. Don't be anxious about anything. In everything. Here's what we should do. In everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So what do we want to do? We want to pray. We, we want to pray. And prayer here, I think, is kind of like a, a general going to God, going before God, right? Paul's saying, in everything, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, go to God in prayer. Go humble yourself before the Lord. Go fall on your face, fall on your knees before the Lord, praising him for his holiness and his goodness and for the, 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 the sacrifice of Jesus. Like, go to God. But then he says prayer and with supplication. Supplication is specific, right? How good is it to know that God wants to know, like, the depths of our hearts, How good is it to know that, I mean, he knows, but he wants us to come to him, sharing with him everything about who we are. All of our fears, our anxieties, God wants us to come to him with those. Like, you don't have to hold on to those by yourself. You don't have to feel like you're alone in this life, just with this, living with this crippling anxiety, this feeling of what's going to happen, what if this happens, what if that, like, when those feelings come up, what do you do? You go to God, and you lay him at his feet. And you say, God, I don't know what to do, but I trust you. This is scary. I trust you. This is hard. I trust you. I don't know how this is going to end, but I trust you with supplication. And then I love this, with thanksgiving. When was the last time you thanked God for a trial? When was the last time you said, thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to grow my faith? When was the last time you said, thank you, Lord, for taking me deeper in my trust and confidence in you, when was the last time that you said, thank you, Jesus, for an opportunity to experience greater levels of your faithfulness, right? The Bible says even when we're faithless, he is faithful. With thanksgiving, Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Through prayer, general, and supplication, specific, with thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this suffering, for this trial, for this tragedy. Thank you, because I get to experience you. With thanksgiving, present your request to God, and then what's the result? It's peace. The result is peace. The peace of Christ will guard your heart and your mind. In Christ Jesus. Peace that surpasses all understanding, right? Like everybody wants peace. Every, I think everybody in the world wants peace. Everybody wants to experience peace. Everybody wants to live at peace, right? We like 
Everybody wants to live in peace, experience peace, but we have peace that surpasses understanding. And that's amazing, right? Because that means that you can go to the places that you live, work, and play with the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding, that guards your heart and your mind, and people are going to look at you like you're crazy. Well, how can you be at peace when your mom doesn't know the Lord? How can you be at peace when your wife is sick? How can you be at peace when fill in the blank for whatever it is for you? Oh, because I know Jesus. I've laid this at his feet. I've said thank you, Lord. Because I know you're working for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purposes. With thanksgiving, the peace of Christ. We all want it. The good news is we can have it. But it's only found at the feet of Jesus. Anxiety, it can be, it can be crippling like Matt Mellon on the face of a mountain. Not, not where you want your crippling anxiety to kick in, but it happens. It can be absolutely crippling, but we can take the next faith step forward by remembering every day, reminding ourselves he is faithful and he is with us. He's faithful and he is with us. What, what if, as we begin this like, new school year, this new season that we're going into, what if, what if we woke up every single day and just said, Jesus, you are faithful and you are with me today? And then as you, know, you have your first unfortunate interaction with a coworker, you said, Jesus, you're faithful and you're with me, right? And then as the day just wears on you, you reminded yourself, Jesus, you are faithful and you are with me. And then you go home and you have like this little bickering thing with your spouse or an unfortunate conversation with a family member or a friend. And after that, you say, Jesus, you're faithful and you're with me. And then you rest your head at night with the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. And you say, you are faithful and you are with me. He's faithful. He's with us. He wants us to come to him and in prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. And he is ready to fill us with his peace, peace that surpasses all understanding. Friends, we're going to be looking at clogged arteries, things that threaten our spiritual health. As we do so, I pray that whatever the Spirit may lay on your heart or the teaching from God's Word, that you wouldn't just hear it and then walk out, but you would hear it, it would resonate and you would make the changes. You would allow the Lord, the great physician, to heal and help your heart as we walk through, journey through life together. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you again. Your word has gone forth. Isaiah promises that it won't return void, and so I rest confident in the fact that there's at least one person here who they needed to hear this message. They've got an anxious heart. Maybe many of us have anxious hearts. Jesus, we can lay that at your feet. Trust, rest, walk, knowing you're with us. You're good, you're faithful, and you have abundant life in store for us. As we sing this song, Lord, we pray that, again, it would be an offering would be worship, response to what you have done on our behalf, God. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.